So I guess we're going to start it. Uh, I'm Jason Nestor, and I'm going to be talking today about deception. Um, so I'm going to be talking mostly about using deception for early detection. Uh, so I mean, deception is a very broad subject. Um, it's something I really love, but I'm just going to look at it purely from the lens of that early, early detection of an active attacker on your network, and then I'll come back around to talk a little bit about possibly using deception out on the DMZ, out on the internet, to sort of separate the general junk, the general noise on the internet from the active attacker and trying to make that a little bit more easy to catch. Um, so yeah, trolling the attacker, being a puppet master, kind of controlling that engagement. Uh, quick thing about me, uh, so yeah, I've done a little bit of everything. I've been in IT since 98, started off as a Novella engineer, uh, NT, AS400, uh, from there, I went to system or application development. I've been a DBA. I've been a VMware admin. I've been a storage admin, and uh, finally ended up in security. And I've done my best to make a career of that. Um, but yep, right now I'm uh, getting ready to start a new position next week, and super excited about that. So moving on, what is deception? Um, so deception is, from my standpoint, it's just creating information technology objects that have no real value to the organization, but are realistic enough to trick an attacker into thinking they're legitimate, and then monitoring for things accessing that. Um, so it's a, it's a great way of using the fact that you're on your home turf and you know what's legitimate in your network to trick an attacker into giving away their presence on your network. Um, the biggest thing is it needs to look real enough to fool an attacker, but not so real that your actual users start using it. Um, I would also add, because it keeps me up at night that when I'm uh, deploying deception in an enterprise, it needs to be safe enough that you're not giving an attacker a vulnerable box on your network for them to exploit, because my god, how embarrassing would that be? Um, and it's a, it's a great way of playing games with attackers and making them punch walls. Um, one of my highlights of my career was getting a red teamer that I truly respect to swear at me. Um, after he spent months on my network and just couldn't get anywhere and finally he decided to uh, move vertically in the network and we caught him within 30 seconds and sent him a picture of his Dropbox and it's like, mother! <clears throat> um, so that's, that's good stuff. You know, we always talk about in InfoSec about, uh, you know, the, the rock stars of the red team and how fun it is for them to come in and be all cool and, you know, no lunch until I get domain admin on your network and defense never gets that kind of stuff. Right? I mean, you never get to be cool. This, to me, is cool. Um, making, putting a little bit of egg on the faces of your red team, that's fun. Um, so why would you bother? Uh, so a little story. Um, used to be part of a, a large retail company. Yeah, if you want to know more about me, there's a social network for businesses you can look me up on. Um, but I used to be a part of a retail company that was part of a very large investment firm, and we would have we would have monthly meetings of all the InfoSec people. And one of the InfoSec guys that I really, really uh, respect, and I thought he was great, but he made this comment one day about, well, you know, let's face it, if you get a good attacker on your network, it's game over, you're done. Which, I, I derailed this entire meeting for like 45 minutes, saying that's nonsense. I mean, they're on your network. This is game on at that point, in my opinion. Because you, know, you know what's real, your users know what's real, they know, where they should go, and they're not looking around. The attacker doesn't. They, as soon as they get on your network, it's up to them to be as quiet as they can. So the more you lead them the path you want them to take, the more likely they are to trip your sensors and you know that they're there. Um, it's a great way of using attacker tools against themselves. One of my favorite things to do as an InfoSec professional, professional is to watch presentations of red teamers that I respect who do a great job of telling how they do their jobs or watching pen testers in action and just seeing what tools they're using and what they're doing today. And in the back of my head, I'm saying, all right, well, how would I trip that up? How would I trip that up? How would I trip that up? So, I mean, I have a laundry list of, here's the tools I know attackers are using right now or I've seen videos of people using these. How would I give those tools what they're looking for, but it's what I want them to see. Um, so it's a really fun way of letting them use their own tools for their own demise. Um, slows down attackers, and we love to talk about dwell time on a network. The more of this crap you put on your network, the harder it is for an attacker to move. It sets that tempo really slow on them. So, you know, when you get to the point where, yeah, they've been on your network for 180 days, but they haven't been able to do squat because they're scared to move. Again, that's good stuff. 
um, and mislead them with fake news. You know, we're talking Russian disinformation here. It's so much stuff on your network, so much crud that they just don't know what to trust. And I did a Google image search for fake news, and Oompa Loompa came up. You can figure out why that is. I don't know. Um, so why would you bother? Uh, it's inexpensive. Everything I'm going to talk about today is free. Uh, there are certainly some really cool vendors. There's people who represent vendors that do this section in the room today. Um, there are super cool vendors that do really neat stuff here, but you can do a lot of deception for free, and it's easy, it's cheap. Um, low false positive, if you do it right, there really should be no reason for deception to get triggered. Um, it should get to the point that if one of your deception boxes does get triggered, it should be a, a pretty obvious, everyone stop, go see what the heck that was. Um, so you need to be careful with it and make sure you don't put too much out there that is too close to reality, but it's one of those things that in a normal environment, as long as you are careful, this could be one of those few things that you have that just doesn't waste your time. I mean, how many people here spend a lot of time chasing down IDS events that are useless? I know I do. Um, so that's one of the things I love about deception. It's just, there's no impact. Um, it's unexpected. Um, Red teamers, tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, but I, I don't get the impression that many organizations are doing this. Um, when I have pen testers come in, it's always a, oh, well, hell, that's going to be fine. Um, so I, I think they are catching on. I think more organizations are doing it, and I'm seeing tools coming out from the red team side of trying to detect when deception's in play. Um, and certainly a, a lot more focus on trying to stay stealthy. But I mean, it's hard. So it, when someone comes in, especially at a big old corporation, they're expecting to walk in and you know, launch a responder and have you in two days or in 20 minutes, something like that. And when they walk in and it's just pure deception, I don't think they expect it. And again, it's, it's a ton of fun. It really is. Um, OK, so I apologize. Anyone who's seen Dave Kennedy speak in the last like two years has probably seen this 40 times now. But I, I do love this slide, or this Twitter conversation. So essentially, Jeremiah up top is saying that an adversary only needs to find one vulnerability to gain a foothold, and you know they just need to find one system that um, the, the target doesn't know that they have, which for a big company, how hard is that? But then Egypt replies accurately with counterpoint. Once you're on a system, adversary rolls reverse. Blue team only needs to find one IOC to catch red, which I think is just screams in my mind, deception. I mean, just give them as many IOCs as you can, or ways to trigger IOCs. Um, all right, I'm gonna keep harping here. You can sort of read that. So, um, this is just one of my favorite web comics, and uh, it, it's great since we're gonna be talking about compliance today too. But you know, it was one of those silly perception versus reality things. So, I think this just represents enterprises really well. You know, upper left-hand corner, you got the PhD who's talking over everyone's head about cool buzz terms that isn't practical, nothing really exists. Upper right, you have a vendor talking to CISO about some six-figure box that's you know going to solve all the problems. And CISO, well, let's install it. And you got the compliance guy who's quoting regulations or requirements that you know your attackers also know those requirements. So let's make sure we're following our open playbook. Um, and then of course the C level saying we passed compliance, we have antivirus, we got insurance. Quit wasting money. On the right hand side, you have the actual pen tester who has access on the network, and his buddy asks him, "Well, how did you get on there?" Well, they weren't looking for me. And at least in my experience with enterprises, this is super accurate. Uh, you know, we all have the kind of the same playbooks. You know, we follow the same frameworks. Oh, I'm, we're NIST. We have the same tools. We're Palo Alto Shop or Cisco Shop or what have you. And it's, it's a small pool of de defenses out there. And the attackers know that too. I mean, how many people have had a pen tester come in and launch an nmap and say this goes by every IDS we've ever seen? Yeah, it happens, and it's because they have access to these same tools. So I think defense needs to shake things up and needs to do the unexpected now and again. And again, deception is not terribly expected. All right. Um, so it's not all great. If you aren't careful, you can confuse your users and have them start using your deception stuff. It's a bad day if you have like a fake file server out there and you realize that your end users and marketing have started using that because they have more space in the production file server. And yeah, and you're not backing that up. So you can be, it can be dangerous. Um, externally facing deception stuff on the internet, you might ruin your corporate image. Um, someone starts sending you um, links to Shodan searches saying, you guys see how vulnerable you are? And it's all bunkus, it's all fake, but they don't know that. And I've been on the receiving end of that. 
Um, can be a tough, a tough sell in some organizations. What I've experienced are orgs saying, well, deception's kind of a, a new thing. That's kind of top of the pyramid stuff. We're nowhere near there in the maturity level. And we're still trying to lock down lateral movement. Okay, I get it, but I don't see what you have to lose. But it can be a tough thing to sell, and it's kind of hard for some folks to get conceptually. So if you're passionate about it, you can go to bat, but you might get some pushback. Um, and the boring bullet point of it's no substitute for good basic security practices, nothing is. Um, I think, yeah, you, you gotta get your house in order. Um, this is not a conclusive list. This is not Jason Nestor's list of everything you need to do and do these are secure. These are things that if you're gonna do deception, at least free deception, I think you need to have these things in place because they open up uh, where you can stick your deception easily. So first thing, first and foremost, you need centralized logging. If you don't have that, I mean, deception, is, it's all based on alerting. You have to trigger an alert and you have to get that alert. The best way to do that is with centralized logging and you should just have centralized logging. It's important. Um, don't need anything fancy. A simple elk stack, gray log, Windows event porting, great stuff. Um, I love gray log. If you got some money, super, dancy, super duper fancy sim is always great. You know, if you get Splunk, I got my Splunk sticker. Um, I have nothing like it. Uh, I do believe there's some representatives of a fantastic MSSP in the room who uh, would love to sell you some business and some deception too while you're at it. Um, but yeah, I mean, have some way of getting those alerts and getting those logs to you. And then shut down an attacker's easy wins. Uh, again, going back to that no lunch before domain admin, shut down some of this stuff. Uh, insecure enabled by default CRUD. You know, Windows never stops doing things, so net bias. Uh, LL, LLMNR, WPAD, WDigest, all that stuff, make sure that crap is shut down. Because um, once you have that stuff shut down, and you know attackers are expecting that stuff to be alive, you can use that to your advantage. Um, prevent stupid passwords like Winter 2019. Everyone knows why that's a common password. All right, and I can explain. So, er <laughs> So Windows complexity, Winter 2019 would meet the, winter, the Windows complexity requirement. That is typical length of a, of a password policy that would comply with that. A lot of corporations have 90 day password expirations, which happens to align with the seasons of the year. So you get Winter 2019, Summer 2019, Fall 2019, or Autumn 2019. Um, so you know, an attacker just wants to do some password spraying. Chances are right now you would see some Winter 2019. If you make sure that that's not a valid password in your environment, you can all of a sudden create deceptive user accounts to have that password and lead them astray. Uh, turn on your bloody host firewalls, please. Um, so what I always experience with this is companies try to boil the ocean with host firewalls, and they go, well, this desktop user needs to be able to access these 15 servers, and that one needs to access these three servers. Don't do that. Very simple Windows firewall rule. If you have a workstation VLAN and a server VLAN, your workstations don't need to talk to your workstation, so an inbound outbound rule saying this works, workstations can't talk to the workstation VLAN, can't receive communication from workstation VLAN, shuts down so much CRUD, it's two firewall rules on Windows Firewall deployed by GPO. And again, it stops so much traffic, so much of the attack, and then you can use fake stuff that is open to that. And you know, someone pops in your network and they're in your workstation VLAN, they see a ton of fake honeypots out there and they think, oh cool, I have access to stuff on this, on this network. Everything else is shut down. Um, labs or ships, this, uh, the local admin password service same stuff. Um, just cool way of making sure you have unique passwords on all of your uh, endpoints. Uh, ships is a trusted sex solution in the same space, which if you're a PCI corporation, you might want to look at that because labs is interesting in that it doesn't encrypt the password, which I don't see how that passes PCI inspection. Um, although I've never seen a PCI auditor complain. Anyways. Okay, so Peter Kim's pen testing standard. This is, uh, Peter Kim's the author of the Hacker Playbook. Uh, this is his method of running a pen test. It's loosely based off the pen testing execution standard. I throw it out here just because, you know, just like we use NIST on the defense side or something along those lines, or we have our compliances and, you know, the attackers know our playbook, we have a bit of their playbook too, right? I, mean, I think this is, depending on what your objectives are, this is kind of consistent of what an attack is going to look like. And in my opinion, every one of these has a spot where we could use deception to throw them off. 
Persistence is a little bit tricky, but I think most of these, you can do deception. So when I look at this, I look at it and say, all right, well, how would I use deception to throw off intelligence gathering? Or, you know, make sure that that initial foothold is maybe not where they're thinking they're getting a foothold. Uh, so I'll kind of come back to this. All right. So what I thought I would do is just go over some, like a two billion mile high of some attack, some attack situations or scenarios, and then where I would put deception to catch it very early on. Um, so I'm finally getting to the deception. I'm, I'm done selling you now, and I'm going to give you examples. So scenario one is foreign device on the network. Um, so someone has tailgated their way into your environment, and they dropped a Dropbox on your network somewhere. Uh, you don't have 802.1x or NAC, which would be nice. but So they're on your network, but they don't have credentials. Uh, they're not domain joined. They're just trying to figure out what they can get go from there. This is you know, my story earlier of getting a, a red team uh, attacker to, to swear at me. This was their scenario. Um, so you know, goals for an attacker in this environment, mapping the network, finding credentials, looking for weak spots, you know, looking for open file shares, things like that. Um, you know, trying to figure out what they can do now that they're on your network. Every one of these has a spot where we can play with them. Um, so, one of the first things I would expect an attacker to do here is try to use DNS at advantage, do some reverse DNS lookups, see you know, what other devices are on the network. Uh, so, defenders right now might be saying, well, yeah, that's cool. I should probably have something in my SIM saying single source IP on my network doing a ton of DNS lookups, because you have DNS on your login, right? There's no head nodding, that's it. Um, anyway, so. One source IP doing a lot of DNS lookups, that should trigger an alert. Yes, and that absolutely you should have that, but it's a race condition. You know, what's your threshold there? Five DNS lookups in two minutes? Uh, you know, if I have a box on your network and I don't think I'm going to be detected, I could take months. So, you know, where, where do you trip that up? So you can't rely on that. But one thing you could rely on is just having a ton of DNS records that are bumpkiss and should never actually be requested. You know, you set up some blocks in your, you know, you set your DHCP scope to block off a pile of addresses and all your subnets, assign some DNS and some A records to those, and record those in your SIM or your log management, and if you have like a lookup table, and anytime you see someone actually request those addresses, trigger an alert and try to figure out, well, who did that and why? Um, it, this stuff trips people up so quickly because you don't expect that. Oh, I just did a DNS lookup. That's more or less passive, and boom, you got them. It's also I'll say this a few times in different places. Stuff like this is a really cool way of finding people on your at your company who are maybe those diamonds in the rough. Like I found a couple people on our help desk who were just out there playing and experimenting. So you know, you first you run like, hey, what the hell's going on? And then talk to them. Like, oh, cool, come with me. Let's go talk. Um, stuff like this is kind of fun in that way. A little added advantage. Then we'll have to make your photo. Makes me sad. That's Robert Smith from The Cure. All right. All right. Another way of doing it. Uh, so, Nmap. Again, <coughs> pen testers coming in and yeah, they're always so proud of their Nmap scripts that, oh, you know, no IDS that we know of can catch this. Um, which, yeah, they're very good at that. But honeypots, honeypots, honeypots. The more the better. So, just devices sitting on your internal network that have no reason to exist except for to let you know that someone connected to them. Uh, so I list here artillery, which is, I believe, originally written by Dave Kennedy, is now maintained by our friends over at Binary Defense. So the thing I run into when I talk to people about honeypots is concern about expense. Well, you tell me you want a thousand of these things, so I guess we have some old laptops we can use. It all comes down to what you want to accomplish. If you want like a full honeypot type network with like real applications, real servers, you know, I want a full SQL database and yada yada yada. Yeah, that, that's a pain in the butt. If all you want is a box that listens and tells you someone connects to it, you want? I have a solution for you. I did lie. I said everything I was going to talk about is free, but it's practically free. Here's your honeypot. Cheap Raspberry Pis. Grab these guys, put them. 200 IP addresses on them. I actually had to look it up. I think uh, from what I was reading, someone got 4,000 IPs on uh, Raspberry Pi running Linux before it just exploded into flames. Um, so all those DNS 
all those DNS reservations he did in the last one, assign those addresses to a Raspberry Pi, put artillery on it. So what artillery is, it's just a simple, simple script that listens on ports that you configure. So open up ports that would be expected to be found, that some that they'll probably look for, 445, 3389, 22, 1433, you know, those sorts of things. And if anyone ever connects to them, it pops out to a text file, the source IP address of that device that connects to it. You have that picked up, go to your centralized logging, and alert. And this is a $40 solution to get 4,000 honeypots on your network. Someone goes and launches an NMAP scan on your network, and good luck missing that. Um, I can't talk enough about this. This is such a simple solution. And what's that? <laughs> okay. Well, don't put four thousand addresses on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I should have asked at the beginning. Is anyone doing deception aside from binary defense? Is anyone doing deception in there? Yeah. What are you doing? Oh, sorry. I'll talk to you after that. We shouldn't talk products. Neil, I said. Cloud server resource manager. Okay. Cool. All right. So yeah, uh, this is. I honestly, I don't see why you wouldn't do this. This is just so cool. Um, other stuff. Responder. So every pen test I've seen in the last five years. I don't know how long has Responder been around. Pen tester comes in, plugs in, launches a terminal, launches Responder, minimizes the terminal, says, "I'll check on that later." Um, so first of all, shut that nonsense down. LMNR, NetBias, uh, names are, kill all that nonsense. Set up your firewalls, block it. Um, most companies can do this with zero impact. NetBias might cause issues with some seriously legacy crap, but that should be few and far between. You should be able to set firewalls to segment that stuff as much as possible. Once you have that, again, get your Raspberry Pi out, and there's a great little utility here called Responder. All this thing does is every five minutes launches as an LMNR request and lets you know if something responds. Um, so it costs you nothing, have it running. Someone comes in, puts responder on your network, you'll catch them within five minutes. Um, again, this is kind of an interesting way of catching someone playing around your network that might be somebody you might want to start mentoring. Uh, but there you go. Okay, so by this time, I hope to God you've already caught them because when an attacker gets to this point, they're, they're done with being quiet. But things like RAR, uh, eyewitness, so these are things that scan for scan web ports and take screenshots of all the, the, the landing pages, the, the front pages, and puts them on a nice little thing and can scroll through it. I love to feed them stuff to get them salivating. So ancient Tomcat pages, Tomcat admin pages, uh, I mean, they're like tripping over themselves to get to that stuff. Uh, insecure Jenkins, the, the Groovy script stuff. Uh, DVR pages, uh, because no one ever changes the admin page for you know, your webcams and things like that. Uh, printers, put some of that stuff up there and watch them play. Again, chances are you've already caught them long for that. If you're, or I'll be honest, I do this purely for the pen testers benefit. Um, for an actual live attacker, God hopes you've caught them long before they decide to be this loud. But this is fun to play around with your pen testers. Um, fake file servers, also super useful. Uh, so SMB v1, unsigned SMB, and just open shares. Uh, fill them up with lots of documents that look like social security numbers might be present, things like that, like Cobra documents, um, and watch them play. And again, so much artillery. It's, it's a, such a simple solution. Okay. Trolling level 1,000. Um, so other things, if you do have a NAC or 802.1x, you, know, you have some sort of method, one, one, congratulations if you actually got that working. Um, but what folks do, if they have that running, is someone plugs in a foreign device, they either shut down that port, put them in a quarantine network, or put them on guest, which is cool. That's awesome. On the other hand, you are letting the attacker know that they're already on, that you're already on to them, and they're going to get the heck out of there. I would recommend that if you're going to do this, go ahead and throw some of these Raspberry Pis in that network as well. Give them a quarantine network and feed them some deception to let them sit there and linger a bit and give you enough time to hopefully track them down and maybe see what they're doing, maybe get some law enforcement involved before they run out the door, maybe get a taser involved. Um, but, and if you have this technology, if they're on a quarantine network, what's it hurt you to let them stick around for a while? Um, Deception Wi-Fi, you could do the same thing here. So if you have a 
Neo ISF uh, SSID, maybe have a Neo ISF port that is just, you know, with a simple password, let people fall into that, and oh cool, I got another corporate wireless network, beat it with deception. Just a note, you will probably end up with actual employees trying to get on that network, so you have to tell them what the real one is. And then deception active directory domains. Uh, I've done this on my actual internal network, just had another AD domain, I've even done one-way trust with it. Um, just to make it really hard to detect what is reality here and what is fake. Um, watching an attacker fool around with a domain that does nothing at the end of the day, it's cool. All right, so another scenario. Now, so that was a foreign device on my network. They had nothing to start off with. Let's say they actually compromised the system on my network, trusted system, so they have you know, an active login, it's domain joined, so a lot of that hunting and searching is off the table. Um, so if you have a good attacker, they're going to be try. They're going to try to be quiet. They're going to see what they have on the system, what they can use already, uh, and you know they have no reason to search as hard. So I have some attacker goals here. And red teamers, if I'm completely full of it, please tell me. Uh, but determine what they have access to, both on the network and locally. Maybe escalate permissions if they have the ability to. Try to establish permanent, um, enumerate, move. Uh, other things you might do is check the health of the system. See. Uh, if that system reboots constantly. So I, I mentioned this because you could do things like change system up times, maybe feed some false logs that make it look like the system behaves differently than what they're expecting. It's kind of outside the scope, but anyways. So they're on my system. One of the things I'm, I'm gonna do, and this really isn't deception, although I can make some cases here, is just watch certain commands. So everyone's doing command line logging along with their DNS logging. So you know the commands that are being executed on your network, on your endpoints? No? All right. I fully recommend it. It's super useful. Um, I know SIMs are expensive. It says the guy with the Splunk sticker on his uh, laptop. You don't need to do that. Elk and Greylog are brilliant for this. Um, but look for the commands that just your standard users have no reason to use, and an attacker might find them to be super useful. This used to be a way more useful control, uh, Metasploit, and, it does most things, you know, in memory and the API doesn't, they don't launch commands as much as they used to. But still, um, you, you might catch some stuff here. But, so I list like, who am I, Netsh? How do you guys pronounce it? I always pronounce it Netsh. You say NetSH. NetSH. NetSH? NetSH. Should we do a survey, a poll? All right, Reg or Reg? Reg. Reg, all right, I'll probably say Reg, minority. Yeah. Um, so, but these commands that, Bill down in county has no reason why he would ever run this. So if all of a sudden you see Bill's user ID, you run these commands, I think that's worthy of a call. I think that's worthy to go check out what's going on with Bill. Um, and then again, it's another great way of finding those diamonds in the rough. Um, so a couple links here. Uh, the top one, that's from Mo Odvar, and I apologize to Mo if I am totally botching his name. Um, so this guy runs a website called Living Off the Land uh, Binaries and Scripts. What he has is a list of, an awesome, awesome list of common or built-in commands that can be used for nefarious purposes, that can be useful to someone who has a foothold on a system. Um, and when possible, he also has detection mechanisms. Fully recommend you consume that thing and keep an eye on it. You find all sorts of great gold in those hills. Um, and then, you know, from a defense standpoint, you look at that stuff and you say, oh yeah, I never thought about that command, but I should totally know if someone ever runs that thing. The second link, this is from the Japan CERT. It's a little bit older, but it's such cool research. So what they did is they looked at all their incident responses for the year 2016, I believe it was. Yep, 2016. Um, and looked at what commands they saw attackers use at what parts of the, the attack scenario. And they just indexed it. And so what they gave, gave us then was this awesome list of, yeah, an attacker has a foothold in your system, here's how they're gonna just figure out who, you know, what they have access to. Here's how they're gonna gain permanence, or uh, persistence. And it, it's a, I fully recommend you take a look at it, because I, maybe like two commands in that list is something you would ever, ever see an end user run, truly. Um, so I strongly recommend you look at that. Um, stepping back a little ways, looking at arguments, so if you're logging command lines, you're also logging command line arguments. Um, look at those lowest common denominators, slash add, slash domain, slash delete is what I mentioned here. Forget the command itself, 
it should be pretty interesting if you see an end user launch a command with a slash domain at the end, or a slash header, or a slash delete, or things along those lines. Just getting an alert on that, you're gonna get probably very few false positives, and it's kept some pretty interesting stuff there. Um, so like, someone's playing obfuscation games, and you know they're going around reg and reg, um, but looking at just slash add, that, that's a very broad net to catch, cast, and again, you, it's very unlikely that your end users are gonna do anything with that. String symbols, who knows what a caret does in DOS in the command prompt? Like. Yeah, so basically nothing, right? So if I do a DIR, I get a directory listing. If I do a DI caret R, I get a directory listing. Um, it's a great way of just, if someone's doing very bog standard detection of commands being executed, throw a caret my command. Um, but just why is there a caret in your command to begin with? So just alerting on that is probably a really useful control. Um, lots of ampersands or lots of, lots of plus signs. So if someone's doing some sort of obfuscation and concatenation of strings, um, you know, so there's always these cat and mouse games about this game, but I just take a step back and go, I have three ampersands in a command line. Something's weird here, and I should look. Um, also, this is kind of a cool way of catching people using passwords or passing passwords from the command line, especially if you look for exclamation marks. Guarantee you'll probably find people who are establishing a dash P in their password. Um, and then super long commands. Um, so like if you look at poor Mr. Kennedy who spends his entire life just getting unicorn around Windows Defender through very, uh, very sophistication things. The one thing that's always consistent is that command's like this freaking long. Should you ever have a command that freaking long being launched? So if you're logging command lines, Take a look at those command line lengths, and if it's over 100 characters or so, maybe you want to get an alert on that. All right. Um, back to deception. I apologize for that. <laughs> so I'm on your box. I'm trying to figure out what I can do from here. One thing they might start looking for is credentials. So give them some credentials. Uh, Talk a couple commands here, which by the way, looking for command key and vault command would be two other great things to alert on. Um, but those are just adding things to the Windows credential store. Put stuff like that in your, in your login scripts and just inject fake stuff into your Windows credential store for people to pull down and look at. You, know, you record that on your side, you know what commands you, or what logins you've injected, you look for that stuff being used on your network. Uh, the two links below, Honeybase is freaking cool. Uh, it's basically it automates this, but it does so much more. I totally look, totally encourage you to look at it. And also inject stuff in the memory in the LSAS so you can fool around with WCE and many cats. Um, but it'll do things like inject passwords and registry for things like PuTTY I have down there. Um, you know, it'll, it'll load up a system with credentials. That again, if you know what those credentials are and you're logging properly, you start looking for people using that elsewhere in your environment and you see it, you got them. Um, last two links are Kippo and Cowrie. Uh These are two low yield SSH servers for deception. Uh, so they accept SSH connections and kind of fool around with the attacker, answering commands falsely. Um, so it's, meanwhile, it's recording everything that they're doing so you can learn a little bit about what an attacker might do if they get SSH on the wire boxes while you casually go and find them and tap them on the shoulder and ask them to stop politely. Taser. All right, so other things an attacker might do once they have access to, your, to a box in your network is see what's, what files are on it. Um, so there's a few things you could do here. Uh, Canary files, so this link here, canarytokens.org, it's a super cool site. They have a ton of different tokens that you can build. And what they do is you go and say, I want a, so for this example, I want a Canary file. So I want a, I want a Word doc that if someone opens it, it's gonna call home, so it has like a tracking pixel on it. And it'll call it to Canary Tokens, and you can figure and say, if you ever see this uh, tracking pixel get loaded, send me an email with this information, tell me what Word doc that was. And it's a super, super simple thing you could do. Go create a bunch of them, just throw them on your local systems. Um, or build your own, because, uh, I mean, Canary Tokens is fairly popular, so I think a lot of attackers are fairly hip to it. But build your own. Uh, did you know that if you, uh, just take an HTML file and give it a dot .doc extension where we'll open it normally and so and display it. So it's a really, really easy way of making a, a tracking pixel. Just make a simple HTML file that calls an image, you know, like 
PHP script out externally. I actually use this for phishing campaigns when I want to track um, documents being opened in like a, a Google app shop where people open it in the built-in Google viewer and you know a lot of companies will encourage people to do that if they're not sure on it because you're probably not going to infect someone from the built-in Google viewer. But if you do this, Google can't open it, it just shows an error so it tells them to download the file so it gets around that. Um, but yeah, so having these things here, it's also, I have here, it could be useful for ransomware detection if you're super fast. So, you know, you have this file, you have these files here that are, I'm sorry, I'm saying this about words. So just having some files in general, right? That you, it doesn't have to have a tracking pixel, but files you put on your system that you know about that have no actual value. And since you're doing your logging, a modification of that file sets off an alert. Um, so you can put this up like at the root of your user profile where your user is less likely to go to, or do it as a training exercise and put it in the actual documents folder, but train your users to know that these files are there for other purposes. I would, I would say ransomware because it will be more likely to understand that. Um, but yeah, and then just track and alert if someone ever accesses those files. Does that make sense? Yeah, please. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So I, I admit it's been a while since I. And the antivirus will actually, depending on where your antivirus is, you'll get like some random AWS like IPs to the location because like your antivirus is probably being Yeah. So it's been a while since I've had to administer an AV solution that did file scanning. Um, but yeah, I can see that. Or so, a SIP share if you do like certain types of demand and your SAN file share more. Gotcha. All right, so that might be a, a reason though to build your own um, where you might be able to build in a little bit more controls to it and maybe detect what's causing it and, and ignore some of that stuff. No, that's a good call out. Thank you. Yeah, it would be easy. If you made it yourself, it would be easy to do. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> I got 10,000 alerts. I guess AV's working. That's cool. All right, so this is a little bit more fun. Drive mappings. Um, so getting to a more full-fledged uh, honeypot, building out a, a simple file server, uh, Samba Share, or simple Windows 2008, 12, 16, whatever file server, uh, purely for deception. So what I like to do is just build out a simple Windows file server, run a quick script to pull all the file names off of my legitimate file servers and directories, and then just fill them with Bunkus to, to give them some, some weights and file sizes, and then just monitor access of those files. And then what I'll do is I'll create drive mappings on all my endpoints to those file servers. Um, so this, this little registry fun here, this is actually hiding it from the GUI so your end users won't see these drive mappings and start filling around but it will still show up like if you do a net use from the command prompt, for example, you'll see these drive mappings. Um, so it's just a simple D word value, um, uh, let's say no drives, and it's kind of interesting. So the drive mapping letters are powers of two, so one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, one, two, eight, blah, 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 blah. Um, so you, know, you have an end drive, you want to hide that, you create this D word value, give it an 8192 decimal value, and now anything mapped to N on that end user system will not actually show up in the Windows GUI. Again, will still show up from the command prompt, so if someone has access to that box, they'll see that that drive mapping is there, but the end user should ignore it. Um, and for this, we're, you're logging, do not log on access for this stuff, because just the act of drive mapping it, you know, that Monday morning when people come and plug their laptops, enjoy, um, you're gonna get a lot of alerts. You wanna do it based on actual file access and modification. Uh, but this is another really great catch, and it, it could also be useful for ransomware. So what I'll do with this is, so say my drive mappings typically are like I and J, I'll do, I'll bookend them, so I'll do like an H and a K. Um, one for just humans will probably start alphabetically. Ransomware tends to start alphabetically or reverse alphabetically, so they'll hopefully catch one of those first and I'll bookend my important stuff. Um, and the, the last thing there is making a recursive drive, a recurs recursive directory, so it just keeps calling itself. This is fun to do because if I do like a directory search from a Metroperator shell, um, this will hang it. So you know, I go looking for a specific type of file on one of my deceptive file shares, I hit this recursive file share, they're stuck. And if you disconnect that shell, it'll keep running. 
So hopefully the end user eventually will go, Jesus, what the hell is this system doing? Um, feel free to do this in your user profile as well, but this is kind of a fun little thing to do. And I don't know, I've, I've certainly never tried it, but I would suspect that there's some ransomware that might get caught in this little web here as well, and just sit there and spend all weekend so you don't have to miss your barbecue in January. So. Then Active Directory, so if I have access to a box that's on the network and joins the domain, I'm certainly dumping AD, um, or playing around with it at least. Uh, so nothing really new under the sun here, but simple stuff, and you might as well do it. So Kerber roasting, of course, is a thing. So play with those SPNs, create some fake SPNs, um, and make sure your SIM or your managed provider knows that you've, you've done this and that they call home as soon as they see something used with you. So create your SPN, give an admin account of one, just to make it even more interesting. Give an SPN of a fake service account. I always stick with SQL servers, because those tend to be common. And 4769 is a requesting of a Kerberos ticket. So start watching for those event IDs with your fake SPNs. And again, you should never actually see them in use. And if you see them in use, you know you got something fun going on. Um, and then just make fake objects. You know what your objects look like. You know what your layout is like. So if you're doing privileged accounts and standard user accounts, as you should be, you know, your normal user accounts, and then your admins, for example, will have an ADM underscore or an exclamation mark in their username or priv or whatever. If you know you're doing that, also create a different version of it. So if, if my username is ADM underscore JNester for my privileged account, I'll also create an exclamation mark JNester, and that account doesn't do anything. If the group that gives everyone admin access to the endpoints is ADM endpoints, then I'll create an admin endpoints and make those users part of that group. So anyone searching an Active Directory really doesn't have a clear indicator as to what is those privileged accounts and what is just bunkus. And then again, monitor, 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 monitor. If someone starts trying to play around with that priv account or exclamation mark account, something weird is going on and you should be tracking them down. Um, and then fake domain admins, first of all, everyone gets alerts if domain admin gets used in your environment. Again, I would totally recommend that. Domain admin should be such a rare usage in an environment that if someone actually logs in with it, everyone who has the ability to log domain admin should probably get an email saying, yo, who did that and why? Um, but create some fake ones. Uh, even legitimately add them to domain admin or enterprise admin, schema admin, administrators. Uh, depending on your risk tolerance, give them ridiculous passwords or give them simple passwords. So really encourage people to, to try to use them. Um, prevent login, set uh, login hours to nothing or log on to nothing or you know, use GPO to say that they can only log into one specific system, things like that. And then just watch for usage attempts. Um, so my example here, I use uh, old Croft, like SQL admins or vCenter admins, things that you tend to see in older organizations that you know some Cavalier admin came in when they first set up VMware 3.5 and uh, it's my vCenter admin, I just log on to my desktop with that and I just add it to domain admin because I don't have to think about it. And you see that all the time, so use that sort of bad behavior to your advantage. All right, and now for something completely different. Um, so I'm gonna move into the internet. Am I okay for time? Cool. Any questions internally? Am I boring you guys? No. Appreciate that. <laughs> a few people shook their heads, I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so the internet. Things change a little bit on the internet. Um, so internally, you sure the hell hope that there isn't a lot of just cruft and people are just scanning your network at all times and setting off alarms. On the internet, that's reality. So having boxes that are just out there on the internet and alerting on people doing silly things, you're gonna, you're gonna have a bad time with that. So in my mind, the goal of deception on the internet is to separate the script kiddies and the board people from the actual active attackers and try to get that signal removed from the noise. Um, so I, I had something that I was doing and it was really fun. I was gonna go over that now. Um, I'll make sure I have it. Yep, okay, so let the trolling begin. So, very similar to artillery is this sweet package called port spoof. Um, and what this thing does is, th their intention is that you would put it on your legitimate servers and have it listen on every port that is not being used by your legitimate server. So if you have a web server that's listening on 443, you have port spoof also running that's listening on one to 442 and 444 to 65,000, blah, 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 blah. And it actually responds. So if I connect to it on 23, it'll give me what looks like a telnet prompt, um, or at least a banner. Uh, 
And the whole idea is that it makes scanning someone's environment really irritating. It's hard to find out what's legitimate. I'll admit I've never been brave enough to use it that way. The whole idea to me of taking a production server and telling it to listen on every single port and not putting a firewall in front of it, I'm just too chicken for that. What I did do is I used this for unused external IP addresses in an organization. So most companies have a block of IP addresses and most companies aren't using them all. See IPv4 exhaustion. Um, so since you have these IP addresses that aren't doing bumpkiss, what I did is I added them all to a single physical server, isolated that physical server from the network again because I'm scared. Um, so in case that box did get compromised, nothing, they couldn't do anything with it. Set a port, skip, port spoof on it and told to listen to everything. This is really fun, actually, because one, doing, depending on your parameters, doing an in-app scan on this thing could take like eight to 12 hours per IP address. So where I did this at, there was slightly more than a thousand IP addresses. Um, so that's a fun way of just slowing people down. Um, it makes bad IPs very obvious. So, I mean, this makes it pretty clear when someone's just up to no good and just running you know, a, a crummy scan. Um, it kind of brings it up to the top. Uh, and just the sort of thing I did, I, so to make it harder for people to determine that I was doing this, I gave everything a, a DNS record. The Harvester a Good OSINT tool has a, a master word list of just common um, subdomains you'll see out on the internet, you know, OWA, uh, link, Skype, blah, 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 blah. So going, I just went through that, removed anything that we were actually using legitimately, and pr pr yeah, produced DNS records for all these IP addresses I was using. So when someone went to go against our domain, they had no idea what was real and what was fake. Um, and of course, your end users, they know. I mean, you told them, you, you go to portal.neisf.org, that's, that's where you go or VPN or OWA or whatever, um, but an attacker has no clue. Um, oh, and another tool, okay, it is. Uh, spider trap. So uh, spider trap just creates a little web labyrinth. Uh, it just generates links and links and links and links and you click on it and it just keeps going forever. And it's meant to catch web crawlers. But it's actually kind of fun to do with this. So I put this on the same box of port scoop. I just told them not to listen on 80 and 443 and let spider trap do it. It's a really interesting way of seeing what sort of WordPress compromises are out there today, because all of a sudden you'll see a ton of URIs hit in this box of various WordPress admin pages and strange query strings, like, oh, I wonder what they found. Um, so this is kind of fun to watch, and it's fun to watch that guy fall. All right, so what's this look like? Uh, here's a Splunk dashboard of the box that I set up with this. Um, that 34,300, that's unique source IPs that hit this box in a four hour time. Yeah, it was way more than I thought. And to be clear, that's unique source IP. So that's not, you know, little Billy decided to run open bath scan against my perimeter and they hit you know, 10,000 connections. That would only be one connection in that box. That's 34,300 unique systems hitting this box in four hours. It was way more than I was expecting. Um, oh, it's really hard for you guys to see that. On the right-hand side, that's the countries that they were originating from. Strangely, at that time, the Netherlands was winning. Go Netherlands! Uh, but Russia was right behind it where you expect them to be. Um, top 100 target reports on the bottom. Uh, pretty much what you expect, but this is kind of an interesting little graphic to watch. So 445, duh, 23, 1433. Who knows what 5038 is? That's asterisks. So that's some VoIP fun going on. 80, 33, 89. What's interesting is you can start to watch things grow you can start to see potentially where new vulnerabilities are coming from or what people are trying to hack. So a few months ago, 2323 was on my top 10. Anyone know what that might have been? That was Mirai. So a lot of popular uh, DDRs were listening on 2323, so that's where they were attacking. So they were just hitting everything. Um, and yeah, destinations, so some of the stuff is sanitized because this is actual production. So this is uh, just showing Again, this top 100 sources and what ports they were actually hitting. And again, nothing terribly surprising there, a whole lot of 445. Um, thank you, WannaCry. But kind of interesting, so we have a fancy um, next-gen firewall that does some application uh, identification, just to show how cool port spoof is. I mean, it, it's showing that that's SMB, so it looked real to them, uh, SQL. And some of the stuff wasn't quite right, but I mean, it, for a, someone just doing some very broad attacking, they had no idea, um, so it's cool. And then geolocation, so here's what the map looks like. 
I had no idea when I stood this up that it was going to be quite this bad. Apparently, everyone is bored on the internet. Um, so I look at that, and my first month thought is, boy, we need to do some geofencing. Um, so if you do something like this, that's where I would start is, do you need to allow connections to these boxes or to your perimeter from the world? Because as you can see, the world is mean, and you might want to stop that. So what can you do with this? Um, <laughs> so if you have a fancy schmancy firewall, you might be able to automate some blocking of it. So you know that this stuff is crap. You might want to just plug it in and tell it to block it. I give you a list here of MindMeld, or a link here to MindMeld. This is a Palo Alto project, but it's an open source project. And what they do is they take in IOCs from a various piles of, it, of sources, correlates them, and then spits them out in a way that you can use it. Uh, obviously, they're thinking you're going to put in a dynamic list in a Palo Alto firewall, but you can use it elsewhere. Um, if you do that, be super careful and make sure that you have a beefy enough firewall that can handle that many connections to the block if you get the same sort of traffic I have. Um, you might just need to get a little bit more specific as to what you're blocking if you go that this route with this and make sure that you know, this box had to hit 14 different external IPs and not just everything. Or again, do that geofencing to get some of the cruft out there first. Um, the problem with blocking is, I mean, it's cool, but how hard is it to get a new IP address? AWS is a thing. And it does tell the attacker pretty quickly, or legitimate attackers pretty quickly, that you're onto them. So they can be a little bit more stealthy and quiet. So instead of blocking, what I would recommend is more deception. Um, so this is where we start to get back to finding those active attackers on your, who are really trying to find stuff in your system. Uh, so what I do is I build fake sites, put fake stuff out there. So if, say you have a Pulse Secure SSL VPN, former, formerly Juniper. That's what your users use for VPNing in. Cool, create a sonic wall VPN landing page as well and give it the ability to mess with attackers. Um, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit further here in a second. Advanced level, use port spoof so you detect when someone is playing around. Block all your legitimate sites, but let them still hit all your deception sites. Uh, so they don't know that they've just been excluded from your legitimate resources and they're screwing around trying to break into your OWA page that doesn't actually exist for two days. Ultra advanced level and make good friends with your really skilled network engineers to try to pull this one off. But instead of blocking the legitimate sites, actually redirect them to your deception sites. So if you if your landing page is gateway.neoisf.org and you know that someone is playing around your perimeter, have that source IP get redirected to a fake NeoISF gateway. Um, I never pulled that one off. I wasn't friendly enough with my network engineers. So fake TBN landing page. I meant to put this up on GitHub, but I haven't gotten there yet, so I'll do it eventually. Um, so here's what I built. Simple VPN landing page. I just made it look like um, like a Sonic wall. I just went on Shodan and found someone's Sonic wall page and cloned it. And put it back into it, where I created a false vulnerability. Sonic wall doesn't have this problem, but just have the simple, I give you an invalid username, it pops up and says invalid username. I give you an invalid password, and invalid username, it says invalid password, right? So an attacker can look at it and go, oh, if it says invalid password, I clearly found a legitimate username. I can play with that. Again, SonicWall doesn't have that vulnerability, but I at least proved that one attacker didn't know that. Um, and then, just to have more fun with it, I let them get correct passwords every so often, and just give them an MFA challenge page, so they think, woohoo, I got full creds. Um, so when, what I did with it is I just went out and looked up the average age of the American worker, which is 41, in case you're curious. And then I went and looked at what is the most common first name and last name of people born 41 years ago. And I built a weighted table, a weighted database. Uh, so J. Smith is the most common username, if you're using their first initial last name, of, a, of the American worker. So when you go to log into this site, do a random true-false of whether or not it's going to be a successful username, and weight it. So there's like an 80% chance that J. Smith is going to be a valid user when someone tries it. Did the same thing with password. I just grabbed the, the Rocky password dump, or password list, filled that in and weighted it. Uh, again, put things like winter 2019 way up the top. And I think like the winter 2019 with Jay Smith, you have maybe an 18% chance of that being a full valid username and password combo. Um, to make it look like an attacker who's scripting this is getting somewhere and they're excited. Um, which again, for your pen testers, if you do like a PCI pen test and you get like a week long external one and then a week long internal one, and have them walking in all excited that they have full creds already just hitting the door and it's just, oh, um, it's fun. 
Russia. Uh, okay, so then we have a fake loop. Oh, one other thing. This is a cool way of giving them a fake username standard. So if your username is first initial last name, make your pat make your usernames in this first two last three or something like that. So they don't even know what your actual usernames are, and there's a there's a good way of feeding that to them as well. But giving them a completely different username standard, so when they start screwing around trying to dump stuff in LinkedIn, for example, and trying to figure out who your users are, and they started getting some successes here, they don't even know what your username standard is. You give them something wrong. Uh, so here's what it looks like. So we don't have a Sonic wall. That's that doesn't exist. Um, so stupid unknown username. So that's nonsense. Oh, but. Now they got the end out password, so that's the man thinks he has a username. He's super excited. Um, and there's the ping identity uh, two factor page, and Vince is super excited because he thinks he just found a valid username and password, um, but he's got nothing. Um, and I guess the, the security question for the two factor that does nothing. So they can type whatever they want to, to another game past that. Because we don't even have ping identity. How many you No, I didn't. I was trying to keep it lit, legit, you know? But wouldn't that make you feel so much better when you get called in, like you have to VPN in at three in the morning, but at least Vince McMahon's happy for you, right? That'd be cool. All right. Um, so same thing, OWA has actually a, a legitimate credential harvesting. They don't call it a vulnerability, it's a feature apparently from Microsoft. Um, anyone who knows, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I'm right about this. So if you give OWA and other Microsoft services like Link Server and things like that, um, a legitimate username and an invalid password, there's like a five to 15 second delay before it returns an invalid login prompt. If you give it an invalid username and an invalid password, it's instantaneous, so you can do a timing-based attack. And there's, there's tools out there that just do exactly this, just spray usernames and see how long it takes to get that error back. So this is the exact same application, same backend. It uses the same database, because my idea was, all right, I figured something out from the Sonic wall, I'm gonna go try this at my, on OWA that I also found, and I wanted to get the same results to them. Um, but the only difference here is instead of returning a prompt saying invalid username or invalid password, it just puts a sleep in and waits somewhere between five and 15 seconds. Um, this one's fun because you can actually use actual attack tools and fool them. It's just kind of fun to see the attacker tools get used against them. So this is a little outside my scope, but I'm gonna go over it anyways because this is an awesome place to use it. Honey Badger is a tool from uh, John Strand. Oh, I have to get my book out. Uh, from Black Hills InfoSec, uh, one of my heroes. Uh, so by the way, this is an awesome book. It's Offensive Countermeasures. It's, it's basically just a, a man page for a whole pile of tools, but it's really cool stuff. If you're, if you're interested in this, I totally suggest you get and read it. But what Honey Badger is, it's a little bit of hacking back. Um, and all it is is a little job applet that you try to trick an attacker to run on their system. And it will then tell you, hopefully, based on various public information, tell you where they're located. So it runs a little job applet, uh, starts looking at MAC addresses of the routers and things like that, stuff that Google Street View has been really nice to uh, uh, populate for everyone and geolocate for everybody. And so if you get to this point, right, where someone is trying to launch a VPN session to your network, you know this is no longer the Croft, right? This is someone who's actually trying to attack you, so you might want to try to figure out who the hell they are. Um, and this is a really cool place to do this. Uh, I will just say that there are some legal things you want to talk to your legal department about before you just go turn this on. Like you need to give the attacker some benefit of the doubt. You need to give them some banners, letting them know that you're running code on their system and what it's there for. But interestingly, attackers tend to be just as bad as your end users and just like, yeah, cool. Um, so traditionally, one of the problems with Honey Badger is just trying to convince an attacker to run a job applet in 2019. But an SSL VPN, that's a totally normal thing to see. Like you authenticate to an SSL VPN, it needs to launch a job app, but maybe for a host checker type service or something like that. So it's not out of the ordinary. So this is kind of a cool place to do it, but please talk to your legal department first. Actually, this book has a very good section about how to talk to your legal department about it and what sorts of things you should do to not get arrested. Um, deceptive metadata. So this is going back this does a few things, but this is a, a really great way of feeding them an invalid username format. So you have your website, you have Word docs and PDFs on there, and all that stuff has metadata. One, you should be scrubbing that stuff before you put it on the public internet. There's tools like FOCA that will grab that data and give you a nice list. And there, you know, a Word document can have all sorts of crazy metadata in it. It can have your username, it can have your computer name, so you get computer name and formats. 
You can have application operating system versions. You can have your manager's name, so you can start getting hierarchy information. Um, great, inform great stuff, and how are you gonna track that? How are you gonna know that someone downloaded this Word doc that's on your public website for bad reasons? Well, one way is to put fake crap in there and watch them to use it. So fake usernames, and this is a great place to put a fake username format. So again, if your first initial last name, pretend like your username format is first three characters and last six characters or something like that, and make sure that it has the author name and the username in there so that the attacker can see, okay, that's what your usernames look like. Um, application OS versions, that's a great thing to fake in there as well. So if you're an Office 365 shop and you're running the latest version of Office, put your application version of this was created in Word 2010. Because if someone's going to start doing some, some spear phishing and trying to send some malicious Word documents in, let them think that they're up against the protections or lack of protections in Word 2010 instead of the latest and greatest. Um, same with OS version. Uh, you know, I wouldn't go with XP just because you don't want your customer down this stuff. Going, oh my God! But make it Word 7 if you're Word 20. Or if you're or Word 7, make it Windows 7 if you're Windows 10. Things like that. Um, so again, this is really getting down to you definitely know you have problems. Like someone's definitely targeting you. So if you see that fake username, you know, you go and create a fake username that all your Word documents that are on your Word on your website have, and you start seeing that being used against your printer, you clearly have someone that's messing with you right now, right? They're trying to attack. So I mean, we've we have, right? We we've separated the noise of the internet from a legitimate attacker at this point. Someone has done the standard attacker playbook, they did their OSINT. They got information about your company and they are attacking you. So for me, if I'm gonna have my SSL VPN page up there and I have mdice as a username in this Word document, that's a successful login. Someone tries that with like Winter 2019, I am definitely letting them in and letting Honey Badger run on them because I wanna know who the hell that person is. Um, and, and this is getting someone at the OSINT phase and that's not, it's not often you can do that. So I think this is super cool. Get to the end here. So spear phishing and credential theft. Uh, another common attack, cloning someone's website, sending them a login, or like cloning their, your OWA login page or you know, your gateway or whatever it is. Sending them a, an email, uh, you know, your users an email with a link to it and they provide their credentials. First and foremost, use multi-factor, please, uh, for your external logins. I know it's not an easy sell for some companies, but you know, if someone's gonna see your credentials, at least make sure they can't do anything with it unless they get in your building. Um, Canary tokens, though, again, have this really cool idea where they'll spit out a piece of JavaScript for you to put on your login pages, and you tell what domain you expect this JavaScript be loaded from, and if they ever see this JavaScript loaded on a different domain, they'll send you an email going, hey, you know, you said this should be from the LISF.org, this ran from any zero ISF.org, you got problems. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, the one thing I would say is you might want to consider creating your own, because I would imagine, um, attacker tools that clone websites will probably get wise to this and start looking for that code and ripping it out. So, or at least use some obfuscation techniques, but this is not a hard thing to write, right? This is pretty simple. Um, oh, I just had this idea too the other day and I put it in here as trying to write some code for it. Um, of a browser plugin for an enterprise, I'd be curious to hear what you guys think about this. Of, so you know, you have your corporate laptop and you have your browser on it and you put a plugin in it that anytime it sees a login page it looks at it and says, if you know, compares it to a list of domains that you you have SAML behind or OpenID or whatever that's a valid corporate login, and it puts something up on the user's web browser saying this is legit. Or if they go to a login page that is not one of your corporate pages, it just you know pops up and says, hey, this is not an acceptable place for you to be plugging in your your corporate credentials. Where an attacker would have no idea you have that control there, but it'd be a a clear way for a user to know that whether or not this is a place where they can put in their login. Um, if you're like me, you've had a lot of problems with like marketing departments signing for every G Wiz service that they possibly can, and don't bother running through IT security, and so there's no SAML integration or anything like that. But they're certainly using their corporate credentials for it. So God only knows how many hipsters in San Francisco have your logins. This might be a way of preventing it. I don't know. It, it may be crud too because I don't know how you get on your personal laptops. But I was thinking about it. Fake news, they don't believe they came back. Um, this is something that I do occasionally. So I have like my actual social media accounts and things that I use, and then I have stuff that I make clear are me in the real world. 
So, you know, put in my LinkedIn page, I work for this company, and then I'll use my name and basically, so if someone does some research, says, well, who's the security guy at this company? They find me and then it's easy for them to find, you know, my Reddit account or my Twitter account or something like that. And I'll use that to post rubbish on stuff that we don't use. Um, so I have the example of here we're going to the slash our Meraki subreddit from the Meraki customer, just post some stuff occasionally. So that attacker who's maybe doing some OSINT might think, oh, they're a Meraki shop. Um, don't have FireEye? Cool. Connect with them on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, just to make people think, oh, okay, they're, they're a FireEye shop. You know, while they're doing that OSINT, what are we up against? This is, the bottom one is probably my favorite. And going on like slash r slash sysadmin on, on Reddit and griping about McAfee. You know, if you don't have McAfee, they think, oh, cool. So endpoint protection's out of the mix when we go to attack them, they have McAfee. Don't, don't let them know that you're running something like you know, CrowdStrike or Silence or Traps or whatever. Um, and make them think that you are way behind the times and you're running some crappy definition-based AV. Um, and it, it takes no time to do. I'm not saying that make this your whole life, but occasional posting here and there when you're bored uh, might pay off. All right, so just closing up, the cat and mouse game continues. Attackers are definitely getting wise to this and getting more stealthy and looking out for it. Um, Javelin Networks was recently bought by Symantec. They have a, um, a PowerShell utility out there called Honeypot Buster, which is supposed to help an attacker detect the presence of honey of deception on, their, on the systems that they're running on. I mean, this is a little bit anti-competitive. They're, they'll find uh, honeypot stuff from their competitors. <laughs> My point being that attackers are up to it. I was, at a, I was at Black Hat this year, and then I went to a presentation from a, from a pen testing firm purely on how to detect deception in an environment and you know, avoid this sort of stuff. Um, what I would say to that, though, is one, keep up in your game, absolutely. Uh, there are some really cool companies out there doing really cool stuff with deception, and I fully recommend you talk to them if you want to, but don't rely on them only, because attackers, just like they have access to your IDS, they can get access to this stuff too and see what it is they're looking for. Um, but yeah, keep building your game, keep doing cool and creative stuff. I mean, if you didn't want to keep learning, you chose the wrong field, you should have been a DBA or an SAP admin. <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired, that's right. I used to be a DBA, never an SAP admin. Has anyone else experienced that though? Am I the only one that like DBAs, they learned how to administer Oracle 14 years ago and like, I'm never learning anything again. It's weird. I don't know how you get away with it. All right. So uh, if you'd like to know more, uh, this book, again, can't recommend it enough. Awesome book. Um, if anyone wants to take a look at it while I'm here, feel free. Uh, take a look at the Modern Honeypot Network. Um, it's just a cool little open source way of building out like an enterprise dashboard of administering your honeypots. Uh, Black Hills InfoSec has the ADHD project that's basically a, a Linux distro full of open source uh, deception techniques. Really cool stuff. If you're wanting money, uh, Binary Defense would love to talk to you. Uh, but no, there's a lot of great companies that are. If you want to talk to me about them, I could recommend a few. But there are certainly companies out there that are uh, just focus on deception. They're doing some really neat stuff, especially at the endpoint level. Um, you know, actual processes running your system. Doing things like you dump domain admin, the, the membership of domain admin, and dumping it will display fake usernames there. You know, so modifying the command output, cool stuff. Um, and if you want to talk to me more, I, I'm here. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, snorkel 42 is my actual Twitter, not my fake Twitter. Um, so feel free to hit me up. And a dad joke. I didn't mention I'm a dad, so I love dad jokes. Any questions? See how long people <laughs> joke grenade. Yeah? How do you It helps to be management. Um, so, this one. So the question, I don't know if everyone can hear, but the question was how do you get management buy-in, and so that's, that can be tricky. I was lucky, I happened to coordinate it with a red team assessment, and said, hey, let me try this and see if the red teams fall for it, and they did, and it was like the first time to catch them, so it was an easy sell. And one, you just gotta build up that faith and trust in you that I'm not gonna do something stupid, 
And uh, again, I, like I said at the beginning, it, it has kept me up at night of when I was getting a little bit more cavalier than I probably should. Uh, is there any way they could compromise that and you know, gain a foothold on my network because I was getting a little bit too excited about this deception crowd? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.